thanks for having me over here today to talk about this topic. Um, I realize we have kind of a mixed audience probably, so I thought I would cover a broad range of topics, um, including uh, what are meteorites. I'll spend just briefly remind everyone what they are and how we recognize them. Uh, how do they get from the moon to the earth? This is uh, something that we've only discovered in the last uh, 20 years or so, so it's a pr pretty new, new idea and a new source of samples from the moon. Uh, what is the JSE connection with lunar meteorites? I'll talk a little bit about the uh, collection of meteorites we have over in Building 31 um, in general, and then also some of the lunar meteorites we have there. And uh, finally, I'll, I'll f end up with some highlights of what the lunar me meteorites have contributed to uh, lunar science in a, in a general sense. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead to the next uh, slide. So what, what are meteorites? Uh, just briefly here, they're rocks from space, to put it um, uh, bluntly, and uh, they, they enter the Earth's atmosphere and heat up during, a, a, you know, when they fly, fly through the thick atmosphere, there's a lot of frictional heating, and the outer surface of the rock melts, so they get a glassy uh, crust on the outside, usually black or brown. And um, I'll show you a couple in a, in a minute here. Uh, meteorites are distinct, uh, not only in this way, but a lot of them have metal. And most rocks from the Earth don't have metal. So if you pick up a rock and you see some metallic flakes shining at you, uh, you could have a meteorite. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, you'll see a few in a, in a minute here to, to look at some other features that they have. Uh, but finally, um, detailed observations of fireballs, which are the actual meteorite entering the atmosphere, if, uh, if it survives and hits the ground, uh, they can uh, use observations from a variety of different locations to track, to, to back out the orbit of the uh, meteor before it arrived at the Earth and uh, try to figure out where it came from. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, I don't know if we can see this real well. These are, these are two two rocks that look very similar. The one on the left is a meteorite, and the one on the right is what some of us call meteor rocks. They're, uh, they're usually earth, earth rocks. Sometimes they're obviously from Earth, but they're not rocks. They're sy something synthetic, like a slag. And um, these, these, this is a really good example. They look almost identical. And um, you can't tell from the outside a lot of times. This one has a, it turns out, has a really nice glassy fusion crust you can see down in here, it's kind of shiny. And, um, but in this case, probably you'd have to break it open and see what the mineralogy looks like inside to make sure it's a meteorite. And uh, that is a topic for a whole, whole other day, <laughs> uh, how, to, how to do that. But um, anyway, uh, the next slide just shows also another example of a meteorite that was found in Antarctica with a little centimeter scale bar there. And you can see it might be pretty difficult to recognize them in the field especially when other rocks are around. So in this case, uh, I think this was a few seasons ago in Antarctica, and that's probably a little ordinary chondrite. So they're, they can be uh, spotted. Usually you can tell right away, but sometimes it takes a little bit of extra work to figure out what they are. Why do you find them in Antarctica so often? Uh, I'll, I'll, be t I'll be talking about that some more. but. Uh, Quick, quickly, the, the, main, the main reason is um, they're easy to see on the ice, and they get concentrated in the ice flow, so they come up into uh, predictable areas that we can search systematically. So it's, a, it's a sort of like a, a conveyor belt, <laughs> glacial conveyor belt, and we, we're right at the end. Okay, so uh, we'll go to the next slide. Most Meteorites come from the asteroid belt, and I, I just have one example here. About 10 years ago, this uh, meteorite, Tagish Lake, shown in the bottom right here, and then there's some pieces being collected. It fell in Canada in a, in an, in a lake. Uh, hit, it hit the, um, the uh, lake ice, and there were a bunch of pieces recovered. It was observed as a fireball by a number of people in North America. And they traced, uh, using these observations, they traced the orbit or calculated the orbit 
and it clearly goes back into the uh, into the right in the middle of the asteroid belt. So you can see this orbit they calculated here relative to uh, Mars, um, Earth, Venus, and Mercury in the in the center there. Uh, so okay, this, this is most meteorites. Now some of them come from. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, some of them we've realized come from the Moon and. Uh, there were initially skeptics about this idea was it wasn't ex wasn't accepted right away. Some people thought how could how could um, samples if they were ejected during an impact escape from the gravity field of of a large body? Uh, moon's pretty easy, but what about Mars? So there are there are especially a lot of skeptics about uh, Mars and whether samples would would escape um, in a recognizable form or, or if they would be uh, shocked and melted and unrecognizable. So in 1981 or 82, uh, this sample on the right was returned from one of the expeditions to Antarctica and uh, both the curators at the Smithsonian and some of the sample processors at the Johnson Space Center who had looked at a lot of Apollo samples, they looked at this meteorite and said, this looks really familiar. Uh, I bet it's from the moon. So there was a lot of effort uh, expended on trying to figure out uh, everything about this meteorite. And sure enough, uh, it turned out to be a piece of the moon. Uh, some of the skeptics started thinking, well, maybe there is a way to get, uh, there is a way to get samples from Mars that uh, are actually rocks and they haven't been transformed by shock processes. So again, this is another topic for uh, to talk, we could talk about Mar Martian meteorites. That's a different day, um, but this, these lunar meteorites did influence that field quite a bit uh, in the early 80s. So, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, here's an example. So, the same lunar meteorite shown here at the bottom right. Uh, this is a Apollo 16 uh, breccia, feldspathic breccia, to the on the top right there, and that you can see the similarities in the textures and the mineralogy. And uh, I've mentioned a couple of these points already. So we recognize this material um, as being lunar primarily because we had samples of the moon available in the Apollo collection. It's not really clear how long it would have taken to figure out these are from the moon otherwise. Okay, a couple of other things we know. If you go to the next slide, um, lunar materials have the same oxygen isotopic composition as samples from the Earth. That's good and bad. It's good in the sense that it's similar, they're similar to the Earth, and they're the, they're the dark uh, black circles here. But they're different from almost every other kind of meteorite we have. And so you can, uh, if you think you have a lunar meteorite, you can analyze oxygen isotopes, and it, it, tells you, uh, it can tell you if it's uh, probably that it's from the moon, coupled with other information like mineralogy. And uh, bulk compositional information as well can tell us. If you look at this diagram here, it's a, it's a very old uh, diagram, so it's a little grainy, uh, maybe reflecting my scanning abilities as well. So uh, here is potassium versus lanthanum on the y-axis. And all the samples that are plotted as symbols are samples from the Apollo and Luna collections. These other lines are samples from uh, four Vesta, another source of meteorites. Uh, asteroid 4 Vesta, um, Earth in the middle, dark line in the middle, and then uh, samples from Mars, the bottom line. So you can see uh, elemental, there are elemental discriminators like potassium and lanthanum that can tell us if material is lunar or not. So the um, uh, lunar meteorites, of course, would plot right there with the Apollo samples. Okay, uh, so that's, this is sort of a, in general how you recognize a lunar meteorite. And um, uh, if you go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about how they get here, and because this is a unique, a little bit unique about lunar meteorites as opposed to others, they, of course, you need to get material off of the moon. You need to uh, achieve a, a velocity during an impact. Fragments have to achieve a velocity uh, greater than 2.4 kilometers per second. So. Uh, once they do that, they can leave. Um, uh, this, is, this is, again, another topic that you could go into a lot of detail. But what people have found is that 
you can eject material from pretty small craters, maybe half a kilometer to a few kilometers in diameter, and uh, with a, so not, not very large impacts on the lunar surface, you can still get enough velocity to escape. Once fragments escape from uh, the moon, they can do two things. Uh, they, can, they can be caught into Earth orbit or an a Earth uh, a geo, a geocentric orbit for a while, or they can leave Earth orbit as well and go into heliocentric orbit. So um, there's been a lot of modeling done. If you're really interested in this topic, uh, there are a couple papers by Brett Gladman in the mid to late 90s discussing this. But I, I just show one, one example here. He's done modeling of um, a fragment that's launched from the moon at this point, And it kind of goes into a series of orbits around the Earth and eventually is actually kicked into um, heliocentric orbit here. So a lot, a lot of the fragments do that. And then a fraction of the fragments will actually uh, go into Earth orbit. And some of those, if they become unstable, they fall. They can fall into the Earth, of course. And this, this takes, he predicts that fragments will be, this is a time series of uh, looking at different fragments that attain this escape velocity and uh, have different uh, eccentricities and um, uh, orbital uh, radii. And uh, without going into a lot of detail, these particles start off somewhat orderly after about uh, 10,000 years, a million years, 10 million years, uh, their orbits are all um, uh, have evolved to pretty chaotic um, <coughs> the distribution here. And all of these particles in this region in the center of the diagram have the ability to fall to the Earth. They go into uh, uh, geocentric orbits. So this is quick, 10 million years. A lot of meteorites that we get uh, are older and uh, older than 10 million years. That is, they've, they were derived from their parent bodies um, and, and arrived at Earth over a longer time frame. So this, this is a distinctive feature of the lunar meteorites. If we go to the next slide, uh, here's a summary. There, uh, 10 million years is actually the upper limit for some of these samples. This is uh, just uh, samples versus uh, age in thousands of years. And so 10, 10, 10 million years is out here. And you can see a lot of these have a lot younger ages. Some of them are as, as, um, as young as uh, 10,000 years from point of ejection from the moon to the time they're found at the, at the surface of the Earth. So it's, it's really pretty interesting. This is a story in and of itself. And th they figure this out by looking at cosmogenic um, derived uh, or produced isotopes uh, where cosmic rays interact with rocks uh, at the while they're in space and at the surface of the Earth. And uh, an example is uh, chlorine-36, which is uh, formed by cosmic ray interactions with potassium, calcium, and titanium. And it has a ha once it's produced, it has a half-life of 300,000 years. So you can, you can measure um, its decay in these samples and figure out how long they've been at the surface. Uh, OK, so let's see. Uh, next slide, please. That's, uh, that's the introductory material I wanted to provide to you about what meteorites are and how they get, get to the Earth. Uh, the third point I want to cover is a, a little lengthier, and uh, partly because it's a JSC connection, and I thought some of you may be interested in, in that if you don't know that story. So uh, about 30 years ago, there was a program called ANSMET that was created as a a cooperative agreement between three agencies, NASA, the Smithsonian, and the National Science Foundation. And its, it's uh, purpose is to go to Antarctica and collect meteorites. So th this is, a, this is a, the collection of samples that, that I'm curator of over in Building 31. And you can see we have about 17,000 meteorites over the last 30 years. If you go to the next slide. Um, JSC and ANSMET are not the only programs in the world doing this. There's actually, uh, there's actually even a lot of activity by these other countries. Japan started, started this whole uh, enterprise in the 60s when they found about uh, a dozen meteorites 
in the in this part of Antarctica up here in the Yamato Mountains. Uh, China has recently been collecting meteorites in the Grove Mountains region out here, and Italy has been collecting meteorites. They have about a thousand samples from the uh, Miller Butte, Walcott, uh, Neve, and, and other regions, the Frontier Mountains down here, close to McMurdo Station. And Korea has also been starting now out in this part of Antarctica. So the, the region that the U.S. program has visited over the years is in the, the red uh, rectangle, and it's a huge area. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how this operation works. If you go to the next slide, um, actually the first finds were by some of the early explorers in the early 1900s. They found meteorites, and uh, if you go to the, the next slide, that's what some of these are. Uh, this was um, this was an ex expedition, I think, in the 20s or 30s. A, a photo I I got from uh, Ralph Harvey. And uh, they found they found meteorites accidentally out in this region. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Things, as I mentioned, really ramped up in the 60s, and uh, the Japanese discovered about a dozen meteorites in the Yamato Mountains, and they they uh, these were somewhat accidental. They weren't out there looking for meteorites, but one of the re one of the researchers on the expedition. Um, realized what they were and thought we need to bring those back. So he did and it made a big splash. There was, there was a lot of res, uh, resistance to this idea of going to Antarctica to search for meteorites. Strangely enough, <laughs> uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, people even characterize this as impossibility of recovery of falls from the oceans and polar regions in the mid-70s. And it's funny because this, this same year they started the ANSMET program, if you go to the next slide, um, ANS, uh, Bill Cassidy at the University of Pittsburgh teamed up with some people from the Japanese uh, um, National Institute of Polar Research in Tokyo. For three years they went together and collected meteorites in, this, in these regions and brought back over uh, 600 meteorites. So this was great success. And Bill had tried for many years to get funding and they were uh, hesitant to give him funding. They, they weren't sure if it would be successful or not and thought it was too risky. So when this happened, uh, it was great. At this point, Japan started searching in uh, the Yamato Mountains region and up there at the top diagram I showed you. The United States continued working in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains and where they've been working ever since. And they've developed two separate programs in two different areas of uh, Antarctica. If you go to the next slide, this is a summary of the U.S. program here, all the sites where they found meteorites. And uh, let's see, yeah, close to 17,000 have been found. Um, there's a huge diversity of samples in the collection. They're uh, maintained and curated primarily here at JSC. And uh, we work together with the Smithsonian in maintaining the collection and keeping it, uh, getting it out to the community for study as efficiently as we can. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll sh just a little bit about the field work. Um, ANSMET uh, is based out of McMurdo Station. Can we back up one? I'll just show you real quick where uh, McMurdo is. Thanks. Uh, McMurdo is right here in the corner of the, um, right down here. If you see the big picture of Antarctica here, it's right in the corner. And, uh, okay, uh, go ahead to the next, please. This is McMurdo Station aerial photo. It's like a little city. And all the, all the expeditions uh, leave from McMurdo. They fly out of this temporary ice field here, uh, uh, airfield, which is built on the ice. And this, uh, they have to redo every year because of the seasons. They stay, they stay yeah, they fly from, uh, from Christchurch to McMurdo and then fly out of McMurdo into the deep field. So there's a lot of air support. If you go to the next slide, they, they have uh, C-130 transport planes with skis, and they'll, they'll land out in the, the middle of the continent and unload skidoos, snowmobiles, supplies for a month, and so forth. Uh, if you go to the next slide, they also have little planes to move people around in smaller, um, smaller groups, also, also ski-equipped. That's a twin otter. And if you go to the next uh, 
slide, they can also use helicopters for moving gear around uh, short distances. So there's a lot of air support that makes this possible. Uh, next slide. The camps are um, usually about six to eight people. This is a, f a good example of one of the camps. I think this was uh, near, well, it's in the Queen Alexander range um, where many of the groups have gone over the years. Okay, next, next slide. This is some typical views I just wanted to throw in here <laughs> just to give you a a sense for uh, the beauty of the area and also the starkness. You're here for a month living in a tent, so this is, uh, this is your view every morning, maybe, if you're lucky. It, your view every morning could also just be a, a white plane, <laughs> depending on where you're collecting. Okay, uh, next slide. There's another view with a, sac actually uh, a lot of glint, glare that comes off the ice. These are blue ice fields, and these guys are uh, systematically searching the ice here for for meteorites. Okay, uh, next slide. This is an example. You know, they they leave camp, wherever that might be, and they go out to a, a blue ice field and they do a systematic searching. Um, basically, a grid looking for samples. Every dot you see here is a meteorite that they've found, and the the scale here is probably about five kilometers along the the bottom edge there. Now, the next slide. In addition to searching by snowmobiles, they do foot searches. And uh, this is a moraine, a uh, material that's been left as a glacier advances and then recedes. And you find meteorites in here. There have been thousands of meteorites found in moraines. And uh, so when the weather's bad, visibility is bad, you can go look around a moraine for a day and, and find a lot of samples. OK, next slide. Sorry? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Maybe we should back up. Good question. Yeah, these are not all meteorites. They're, uh, <laughs> these are, that's, it's difficult, actually, to, to at first, to get your, your eye gauged on what is a meteorite and what's not. It can be very difficult because the rocks take on sort of a brown uh, weathering rind on the outside, so it can be confused for fusion, fusion crust. But uh, you, you eventually get pretty good at this. It doesn't take very long. And, um, you have to wander around, though, and, and cover a big area to find, say, uh, a dozen or a hundred meteorites. So, okay. Um, the samples are collected in bags, and they're never touched, uh, if possible, by human uh, hands, you know, bare, bare hands. And they're stored away, kept frozen all the way. If you go to the next slide. Um, oh, there's, I wanted to mention there's been a really strong JSC involvement in this program over the years. And uh, there are names of, you'll, you'll probably recognize a few names here. There have been a few astronauts that have gone on expeditions, and uh, a few people have gone a number of times to help out. Uh, it makes the team stronger if you have a veteran there uh, f for that period of time. It helps a lot. So, and this is just a couple, this is a tent shot showing what it's like. I think that was Christmas Eve or New, maybe New Year's. Uh, so we were, we took the day off. And uh, uh, anyway, next, next uh, I'm a little worried about time. I want to keep moving, uh, but get you a sense for, give you a sense for this program. Uh, the samples are kept frozen all the way until they get to JSC. And if you go to the next slide, they're put in uh, freezers right away, and then we thaw them out under controlled conditions. So they, they don't, um, if you just let them thaw randomly, there's a chance that the water could react with the meteorites. It could form rust if you've got metal or you could, um, you could alter the mineralogy of some of them with having uh, water around. So we try to do that controlled and uh, in a nitrogen cabinet and all the moisture is taken away right away. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, these are all um, announced. They're characterized and announced in newsletters. We've done, um, since I've been here six years or so, we've done about 12 of these. There have been actually 70 or well, more than 70 newsletters announcing this many samples over the history of the program. So it's a huge number of samples, and we have uh, meetings to distribute the samples during the year, two, twice a year. Um, this is just a, a shot of our web page where we announce these, and uh, you can check that out if you're interested. It's pretty easy to find on the JSC uh, site. Okay, uh, next slide. 
Uh, the, the samples are uh, in a controlled environment, so they touch uh, only three materials, four materials, steel, aluminum, Teflon, and nylon. So we try to minimize contamination. And some people don't like aluminum, some people don't like steel, so we can uh, make sure that we minimize uh, contamination depending on the techniques that are required or requested. And uh, if you go to the next slide, we even cut samples. We can cut them in a nitrogen cabinet. This is a big Martian meteorite that was cut in half in the 80s. Um, that's a shot uh, through the glass of the cabinet. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, great diversity of samples. I'll, I'll just leave you with the text here to, to show you the asteroids, samples, um, unknown samples. We're not sure where this one's come from yet. Really unusual um, meteorite and then a bunch of Martian meteorites too. And if you go to the next slide, we get uh, do dozens and dozens of requests for these. Total number of requests, I think, is uh, 2,500 over the history of the program. So uh, just as many as we've received for Apollo samples. If you go to the next slide, here are the lunar meteorites we have at JSC. So there, there are quite a few. This list has doubled in the last six years since I started working here. And... Uh, You'll see uh, diversity of sizes and textures here. I'll get into that in a few minutes, uh, but I wanted to give you an indication of just how many we have here. Some big samples. A couple of these newer ones are pretty small, like one gram, the size of your uh, thumbnail, say. Okay, next slide. Um, what we do, well, one, one of the thing that, things that distinguishes uh, what we do at JSC from other um, meteorites that are available for study is we track every piece. And uh, f for example, this, this sample was found and made available in 1988-89. It's been requested 83 times, subdivided into 250 pieces, and allocated to close to 70 different scientists. We, we still have about 600 grams available of the 660 gram original mass. And this is an example of the documentation that we do to, to track everything and put it, we can reconstruct where pieces came from. And uh, that way we make the most efficient use of the samples too for the, for the community. If you go to the next slide, there are a couple more examples just uh, how we track pieces as they're broken off of the meteorite and sent out for study. Um, the next, next slide. And uh, the, these are heavily requested. It's just a history of the lunar meteorite requests in the last 30 years uh, from our collection. Okay, uh, next slide. I want to get to the science. Okay, here we go. Uh, well, this is the start. Uh, lunar, lunar meteorite, this is a summary of all the lunar meteorites that have been found. This is a figure prepared by Randy Koratev, and um, he, he indicates, and I think my numbers are about the same, this is a moving target, so it's kind of hard to pin down how many we have at any given time. But there are a total of 134 individual stones that have been found. And uh, when you take into account all the pairing samples that maybe broke up in the atmosphere or on the ice or wherever they fell, and you have two masses instead of one, when you reconstruct all of that, you have 63 different meteorites. And um, this is a summary of where they've come from. You'll see this huge difference here from 2000 onwards. There have been a, a huge number of meteorites recovered from um, Western Africa and the Middle East. And this is because they're, they're available commercially. So uh, they're, they, have a, they have a market price. And you can go onto eBay and find lunar meteorites from these areas to purchase. So this, this, is, uh, this really caught on like wildfire from the about 2000 onwards. You can see the Antarctic finds are pretty constant from the last uh, 30 years. So we keep finding them. And um, uh, this is just a nice summary though. Total mass is about 50 kilograms of meteorites compared to the 380 kilograms or so that have been uh, returned by the Apollo and uh, by the Apollo missions. Okay, uh, next slide. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the science. One of, one of the key aspects of lunar meteorites is that they uh, represent, uh, uh, they represent a more uh, representative sampling of the surface. In other words, the Apollo sites shown here 
in white are from a restricted area. Maybe uh, I've heard people or uh, have read that calculations that they represent about 5% of the surface of the moon on the, on the near side. Uh, the idea is that the lunar meteorites may be from a more random sampling of the surface. So uh, this is, if this is right, this is really interesting. We're getting uh, more samples from different parts of the surface. If you go to the next slide, um, what I'd like to do is just cover three areas here, how they've contributed to our understanding of the, the, the age and composition of mare basalts, uh, the age and composition of the feldspathic crust, and then uh, what do they tell us about the lunar cataclysm. So if we go these three topics, we'll, we'll go through these. Quickly, though, I wanted to review uh, rock types. I realize not everyone here is a geologist. And uh, I know Gary Lofgren gave a lecture about the crust a, a month ago, maybe. And uh, I, I wanted to just review what he, t what he talked about. Uh, that there, and the main, the main rock types you see on the moon. Uh, here is a basalt from Apollo 11. Uh, this is a one centimeter scale cube. This is an anorthositic rock, really feldspar rich. You'd find this in the highlands. Basalt you'd find in the mare. And uh, all over the surface you'll find, due to impacts, uh, breccias, which are mixtures of these two rock types. Um, you can see a uh, feldspathic clast here, the white one, and maybe some basalt or darker material here uh, mixed together in this breccia. So the general idea is that you have these two uh, kind of end members, and they're, and they're frequently mixed together in, in breccias. So uh, if you go to the next slide. The other thing I wanted to review is just the basic ideas that, uh, of, uh, that came out of the Apollo missions that you have a, a feldspathic crust, an orthocytic crust on the, on the outer portion. Um, you had later volcanism, basaltic volcanism that poked through and came out to the surface. And as the, ma the magma ocean, which caused the, um, uh, is the source of the anorthosite, the feldspar material that floated to the top, as it crystallized, it left a residual uh, layer deep in the earth, which has been referred to as a, a creep. Uh, it's the residual melt from crystallization of the magma ocean. So you'll see people talk about creep or creepy materials. That indicates... Uh, the last stages of liquid left after crystallization of the magma ocean. So these general ideas I'll talk about here in, uh, in the next few slides. If you go to the, the next slide, okay, we'll talk, we'll talk first about ages of basalts. And this is a summary diagram put together by uh, Jim Papike. And it's the age in billions of years, the bottom there, uh, versus um, uh, missions. And the one thing I want you to notice is that uh, low titanium basalts are really common in, in the mare, and the ages defined by the studies of those basalts were between about 3.2 and 3.4 billion years from both Apollo 12 and Apollo 15. Um, and high titanium, high titanium basalts have a... Um, a distinct range also between about 3.6 and 3.9. Um, so what about lunar meteorites? What do we find? Okay, if we go to the next slide. Here's an example of a lunar meteorite. I couldn't help but show this. It's, it illustrates beautiful texture of a, a gabbro on the right side of the screen. There's a contact here between another rock type on the left, which is a, bre it's a breccia. And so it's, it's been... Uh, it's the same rock type, but it's been broken by impact and then later uh, compaction. So you have both t rock types pr uh, preserved here in this meteorite from northwest Africa. So they've dated this sample using some techniques. And if you go to the next slide, uh, in this case, it's the Samarium neodymium system. The age is 2.9, 2.865 billion years. This is really young, so it's, it's younger than a lot of the other low titanium basalts that have been um, dated from the Apollo collection. Let's go to another example. Um, Miller range 05035, one of the samples we have at JSC, has been dated um, by the same technique. This is data from the JSC lab, uh, Larry Nyquist and uh, Chi Yu Shi. They show 
an age of 3.8. So this is a lot older than the uh, Apollo low titanium basalts. In other words, if you go to the next slide, um, the, the range has been increased from something like 2.6 to 3.9 billion years in age for the low titanium basalts. The other point, which you can see here, this is a slide that Ryan uh, uh, Ziegler has prepared from the uh, Washington University in St. Louis. This is a sodium versus titanium for lunar mare basalts. All the Apollo mission averages are shown here as red triangles. The, um, oh, and, and also uh, yellow and green symbols. Lunar meteorites are shown in blue, and there you can see the, the titanium contents are very low. So uh, what we're seeing is that mare basalts in the lunar meteorite collections are only low titanium basalts. There hasn't been any high titanium basalt recognized yet. This is telling us something fundamental, I think, that, that high titanium basalts are kind of a, a local, more local rock type than a global rock type. So we need to think about that. Okay, that's the, the, the second part I'd like to talk about, if you go to the next diagram, is um, uh, the nature of the crust, the feldspathic crust. And um, what they found in lunar meteorites is that a lot of the anorthosites defined by Apollo, the, the, the really old uh, feldspathic rocks from the Apollo collection fall within this oval. A lot of the lunar meteorites fall at to more uh, magnesium-rich compositions. So this is uh, generally magnesium-rich uh, upwards and uh, calcium content to the right. A lot of lunar meteorites are, are plotting, uh, the feldspathic uh, components are plotting, um, or feldspathic meteorites have mafic minerals like olivine and pyroxene that plot out here. What this is telling us, if you go to the next slide, is that the, the anorthositic crust is a little bit more magnesium rich in the, so far in all the uh, lunar meteorites that have been characterized. So the Apollo range of Pharaoh and anorthosites is shown here in the blue, and you can see they're all shifted up for the lunar meteorites. Again, this is uh, telling us that perhaps the feldspathic crust composition is different than we thought. And so people are actively uh, uh, looking at the data set for the lunar meteorites trying to revise the crustal compositions. Uh, yeah? Since we're planning to go back to the poles rather than where we went the first time, are the, lunar, are the meteorites probably a better clue as to what, we, what the rock conditions may be like where we're going rather than the Well, <clears throat> maybe. I mean, they, they will help. I think that they'll help define a more global uh, view for uh, rock types and compositions. But specifically about the poles, it's not clear yet. I mean, uh, people are looking for, um, people who study the lunar meteorites are looking for samples that might match material uh, or regions of, from the South Pole Aiken Basin that might uh, might be a nice match, but I don't think they've found any really definite, convincing samples yet. There are po possibilities that have been um, bandied about, but I don't think anyone's. It's not definite. Yeah. Uh, if you so that so that this is the uh, the summary I think for what what we're learning about the feldspathic crust from lunar meteorites. The, the main point is that they seem to have a different composition. Uh, if you go to the next slide, the third topic I wanted to talk about is uh, impacts and the, um, the impact rate on the early moon and whether there was uh, the, a lunar cataclysm or the terminal lunar cataclysm that you, you hear it referred to as. In other words, um, this is a schematic diagram taken from a uh, work by Barb Cohen, a diagram that Barb Cohen put together. Um, and uh, this is num number of um, uh, asteroids or comets hitting the moon or the, the impact flux versus time. And um, we generally think of this as, as a smooth decline over time, but there's a lot of evidence for uh, what's been called a lunar cataclysm where the all there was a sudden burst of activity at 3.9 billion years ago. And uh, this has really great implication, not only for the moon, but also for, 
for Earth. The earliest evidence for life on Earth is right after that, and maybe these are connected. And here's the oldest uh, fossil found on Earth about 3.5 billion years ago. So th this is a huge topic of research, and I wanted to just give you an indication of what people are using lunar meteorites for uh, to address this problem. Okay, if you go to the next slide. Um, one, one aspect is technique. There, there are a lot of analytical techniques that have been developed in the last 10 years. And uh, one is, uh, is the ability to look at individual zircon grains um, in any kind of sample. In this case, a lunar meteorite, uh, which is an impact melt. And they, they dated uh, dozens of zircons uh, f using the uranium lead system and found a mean age for the zircons of 3.909 plus or minus 13 million years, uh, a billion, wait, 3.909 billion years, plus or minus a few million years. Okay, so very, very precise age. It's a little bit different from the 3.85 that people have proposed for the, um, the late heavy bombardment or the terminal cataclysm. So the point of this diagram I wanted to make is that uh, we're getting better techniques. We can determine uh, ages with much greater uh, resolution than we could before. And so a lot of people are starting to look at samples with this goal in mind, trying to define different events uh, that they couldn't do 30 years ago. Couldn't, they, couldn't, they didn't have that resolution. So there's been a uh, rebirth in, of interest in not only um, lunar meteorites, but Apollo samples and trying to, to determine uh, better ages. Okay, uh, next, next slide is um, another kind of system. It's the potassium argon system, uh, which is used to date materials. Uh, potassium decays to argon and uh, with a, um, a known, uh, rate, at a known rate. And so y you can use this as a chronometer. And people are using it to date um, impact melts in or melt it, rocks that have melted during an impact. And since lunar meteorites may represent a more um, a random sampling of the surface, people have studied a number of the feldspathic lunar meteorites shown here. This is work by Barb Cohen uh, cited down here to test the idea whether that all these impacts have occurred or a great predominance of them have, have occurred at 3.9 billion years ago. What Barb found is for, for these samples, there are actually a bunch of different peaks. This is um, uh, total analyses. This is a fit she's done to her data. And uh, to total um, analyses versus age. And you can see that she's got peaks at different times defined by the um, analyses she's done on different lunar meteorites. There is, there is one peak that corresponds with the, the terminal cataclysm age but she's got other peaks defined in there as well. So um, at the time Barb did this study, I think there were maybe 15 or 20 lunar meteorites. Now we have 60 and counting. So I think you'll see a lot more studies like this as we get more samples into the meteorite collections around the world. Okay, the next, uh, the next. I just wanted to finish with this slide. Um, some people say, okay, we've got Apollo, Luna, and meteorite samples from the moon, don't we have enough now to understand all the, uh, the history of the moon? And I would say no. <laughs> uh, and I've, I've picked out uh, a number of different topics here. Since we're, we're running short on time, I wanted to leave time for questions, but um, you can just uh, read these yourself. These are some pretty major questions we still have about the moon and even uh, connections between the moon and the earth. The loss of the earth's early atmosphere is potentially linked to the formation of the moon, but we don't understand that very well at all. So these kinds of uh, issues are really big picture um, issues that are still unresolved. And um, as I already mentioned, as we get more lunar meteorites, we'll, we'll, that'll help address these questions as well. But what we really need, or what, we'd, what would really be great are new samples from the moon and uh, we could really address these questions like we never have before. Okay, I think that's all I have. Thank you.
Do we have any questions for Kevin? Uh, you had mentioned uh, early on about some of the simulations run about uh, the, the orbits of these meteorites. Is there any indication in those simulations where the impacts are more likely to occur to send meteorites our way? Is it more likely from the equator, the poles, near side, dark side? I, I don't think so. I think it's it's random. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, and if you look at the distribution of locations where we found lunar meteorites, it's it's pretty widespread. I mean, there's not some do you mean, sorry, do you mean recovery on Earth or yeah, I mean, from the, from the, where, where from the moon? The moon. Oh, where are they? Okay, sorry, yeah. Um, again, I think, I think it's random, somewhat random, but it's, of course, we can read, I can, I can point you to the right references, but okay. since the, the axis of, of rotation is tilted towards the Earth, there's going to be, it's not going to be 100% random. It might be something like... Uh, 70 or 80. I may have read that in one of the papers. Uh, but we can look into that if you want. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. What, what are the upper and lower bounds on the age of the moon? What do you think? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's, if you had asked me that a couple years ago, you'd get, you'd get a different answer. It, it's, it's, being, uh, it's being debated now. There, the range of ages, though, is, um, it's, it's usually portrayed relative to the birth of the solar system. So the range of ages we're getting by different techniques and different labs, uh, different groups, is between about 30 million years after the start of the solar system to about uh, 200, 200 million years after. So there's a large range proposed. And it could be 100 million years? It could be 100 million years, yeah. The Earth is 100 million years? Well, that's, um, that's, that's been proposed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's there's some uncertainty in, in those ages, and the, the variation, the the range you see from 35 to 200 for the moon, is uh, based on different uh, different chronometers. So I mentioned uh, uranium lead and samarium neodymium. There are about uh, eight other chronometers that are used to do these measurements, and some some record uh, high temperature events, some record lower temperature. Events so you, there's a range there that needs to be interpreted, and uh, the story is ongoing. So, I took one recently. I took one system, hafnium tungsten system, which is uh, used extensively in the last 10 years or so. I plotted all the results, and they define a band between. I plotted the age versus year for the last 12 years, I think it was, and they define a band between uh, 20 million years and about 120 I think so and there's it's random you know <laughs> so that clearly it's still being worked out the latest I think we're I think we're um, we're zeroing in on the age uh, for individual systems and the for example that system now looks like it doesn't really have a constraint on the age but it can't be any older than um, about 120 million years after T0, I think. It can't be older than that. So um, there's active work using other systems, other element pairs, uh, to figure out how much uh, younger it could be. So yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> there's a, oh, actually, uh, if, if you go to the last slide, if you want to look into to more about any of these issues, these are some really good sources of information. Uh, this one's on our own web page. One is done by Randy Koratev at Wash U St. Louis. He's got a great, great web page. You can see pictures and uh, lots of references. Um, and ours, we try to keep updated. It's more detailed about the science and the, our technical references. And then this Planetary Science Research Discovery page has lots of uh, topical uh, features about lunar science in general and other, other topics in science. It's great. They do a great job. And so this, this presentation will be archived at Paul's website what, this afternoon or yeah. next couple of days. This so afternoon. yeah, you can guys go and get that. We're gonna have to break up here so I can let Wendell speak. Yeah. You don't have to I just, break up the have room. One quick comment. You you failed to emphasize that we don't know where any lunar meteorite comes from on the moon. So we can only discuss lunar meteorites on the moon in a rather statistical sense. 
if we had context of where a particular meteorite came from, we could say a lot more about what it means about the questions on the moon. Yeah, the par part of the problem with, the, with finding the sources is, as I mentioned earlier, the source craters can be small. And so when you go looking at the surface, there are hundreds and hundreds of... So they might not tell you anything <laughs> about the terminal impact, you know. But what, what, what you can do, what you can do is that you can collate all the remote sensing data and mm -hmm. do a multi-elemental trade space where you plot the meteorite and then plot areas on the moon that have similar compositions, then look for very mm -hmm. fresh rayed craters. Because any yeah. crater that's young enough to make a lunar meteorite has to be a rayed crater. And I think you can narrow down the pin... Uh, you may not be able to pinpoint it, but you can certainly narrow it down to a list of small number of candidates. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah, and that, that's been done for a number of the meteorites, a small, a small percentage of them. Wendell has a good point that, you know, many of them they have no idea. But, yeah, there are, there are some. If you look at the recent literature, 06, 07, 08, there are some candidate craters proposed that are plausible. I, I'm sorry I'm going to have to break this up. If you guys want to keep talking to Kevin, you can talk to Mountain Hall. <laughs>